Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos with me, Clarissa Sorensen Anru. We are talking today about exchange reactions and exchange reactions particularly in terms of what you can do with them and what we will be doing with them. Okay, so I gave a problem like this um, at some point in my time of teaching, which it's been a long time, so th these kinds of problems come up a lot. This is um, basically giving you an idea of everything you can do if you were just given the reactants in an exchange reaction. So the first thing we need to do for this problem is we need to figure out what these formulas are, okay, so that we need to convert the names to the formulas here. So let's do that. All right, so sodium chromate, you recognize that as an ionic compound. You recognize it as an ionic compound because it has sodium in front. Metals um, for us are going to be ionic compounds. You could also recognize the fact that it ends in 8. If it ends in 8, that's a polyatomic ion ending, and you could recognize it that, it that way as well. This is just showing the procedure of everything that we could do, so we're going to keep this as a list as we're going on and on and on. It does not have actually the very first thing we have to do, which is of course, going from the name to the formulas. So let's do that first. Sodium chromate, I need to figure out the fact that this is an ionic compound. I already did that. That's what I was just talking about. And because it's an ionic compound, in order to convert from the names to the formulas, we need to write out the ions. Okay, so what are the ions for sodium chromate? You have sodium, which is Na plus one, and you have chromate which, like I said, was a polyatomic ion. If you're given a polyatomic ion chart, that's what it would look like. All right, you will be given a polyatomic ion chart, by the way. It's at the bottom of the periodic tables that I give you. All right, in order to figure out how many of each I need in this formula, I simply cross those two. So I get Na2CrO4 because I need two Na's and one chromate. Okay, let's do that for aluminum nitrate as well. Aluminum is a plus three, right, because it's found in group three of the periodic table. And oh, nitrate, ATE, again, tells me that it's a polyatomic ion. So NO3 minus one, I'm going to cross these two. Ooh. I don't know, it makes it better when you make noises, I think. All right, and then I'm going to get one Al and three NO3s, and I'm adding those together, okay? To predict the products, first off, notice that um, before we predict products and such, let's notice the fact that we do not currently have states, right? We do not have states for these particular reactants. We would have to assume in an exchange reaction that both of them are aqueous, or at least that would be the best assumption if all was wonderful and well with us. Um, and they, in fact, are. Um, the reason why is because these two abide, these two reactants abide by um, the first two rules of the solubility chart. First rule is um, really the most important rule because it's the only rule that's characterized by cations. The rest of the solubility rules are characterized by anions. But that one uh, actually has cations on it and it says any group one metal, particularly lithium, potassium, and sodium, along with ammonium, will form something that is soluble. And if it's soluble, if it's in the soluble column, then it gets an AQ. If it's insoluble, then it gets an S. So since this is soluble, we're going to call it AQ. Awesome. Fantastic. The second rule, or maybe the third rule, it's one of those first rules on the soluble column again, is that anything that has a nitrate in it is soluble. So if it has a nitrate in it, it automatically gets an AQ as well. To predict the products here, I need to use the exchange reaction pattern. It's kind of a twofold moment here. To predict, predict the products, we're going to use the exchange reaction pattern. We're going to use it on the ions since we wrote them out. And we need to um, then figure out the states based off of the solubility rules. The exchange reaction pattern is to combine the inner two and the outer two. It doesn't matter what order you put them on the product side. 
it just matters that you have both there, okay? The convention is to write the uh, metal first. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna do the two outer, the outer two first. Why the outer two first? Because I felt like it. It wasn't like you have to do it that way. It was just like, hey, I feel like doing the outer two first. All right, the outer two are Na plus one and NO3 minus one. I cross those two. And notice that I'm doing the ions here because that's the only way to figure out how these recombine. That is, in fact, the mechanism we have to use. It's not like, oh, well, I can do anything I want. It's not the way it goes. Actually, I don't think that goes, that's the way it goes hardly ever in chemistry, so beware. All right, I don't, I'm running out of room, so I'm putting it underneath the second one. I'm going to combine the inner two. I'm going to write the ions down right here. We'll rewrite this once we have it done. Al plus 3 um, is in the inner, and chromate is an inner ion as well. If I cross those two, whoo, I told you the noises help. All right, I get two Al's and three chromates, okay? All right, looking at the solubility rules for these, again, Na and NO3, both of those are always soluble, so those get an AQ. And then I told you that the rest of the solubility rules are characterized by the anion, so I would be looking for chromates on the solubility rules. The solubility rules, just in case you didn't catch that, are at the bottom of your periodic table that you're given as well, so hey, life is good. You get solubility rules, polyatomic ions, and a periodic table for each test. Um, and so here, when you're looking at this, you're looking at the chromates. The chromates are generally insoluble. In means not, so they're not an AQ, they're an S. Aluminum is not an exception. If it was an exception to the insoluble rule, it would throw it into the other column. But I don't have to worry about that. And there's my predicted equation, okay? little hard to see so let's make it let's put it back up here a little bit so that you can see it a little better i'm gonna make this go away for a minute here and try to make it go away in a nice fashion and then i'll erase what's underneath Ooh, look at all that work yep easy come easy go and really Let's discuss, while I'm erasing all of this, some of the pieces of what we're going towards, right? What's the point of doing all of this? The point is to really narrow down, particularly in an ionic reaction or an exchange reaction. I, there are lots of ionic reactions. The appropriate way to call this is an exchange reaction. The idea here is to narrow the overall reaction down into what we're really seeing in lab. That's what we want to get to, okay? So, in other words, when you think about what's happening in the lab, there are ways to predict that a chemical reaction has occurred. We've talked about those. You know, you have several pieces, such as you smell something that wasn't there to begin with, you pour two clear liquids together, and suddenly you have a solid, so on and so forth, okay? So those are some of the ways. You have energy changes, which are not really described here. Um, permanent color changes, lots of different ways to figure out that a chemical reaction is happening. But what do we want to look at when we have a balanced chemical equation like this? It's not balanced yet, by the way, but when we have a chemical equation like this, what do we want to see? What we want to see is we want to see the real description of what is occurring in the lab. What am I going to see when I go in there? Um, when I pour these two clear liquids together, what's going to form? And that is given by the net ionic equation. So that's kind of the point we're getting towards. Let me rewrite this so that we have our equation up front and center. All right, and I'm just going to do AQs in the same color. I think we've gotten to the place where we can say, all right. Uh, Okie dokie. And notice I'm leaving a little space 
in front of each of these because I'm going to have to balance this sucker, right? Losing my space here at the end here. All right. Just a little bit off. We're good. Okay, so in terms of talking about this, let me erase the rest of it. And we'll get to the place where we're balancing. I hope you're actually working on balancing while I'm erasing. Remember, balancing is making sure I have the same amount in terms of atoms of each element on either side of the balanced chemical equation. Okay, look at that. So pretty. Board erasing. Part of what makes us teachers. <laughs> a nice clean board. You find a teacher who loves their job. And that's a person who loves a nice clean board. Especially when it's just been cleaned. Like, oh, that's pretty. Okay, so in terms of making this happen. Let's do the balancing here. I'm making sure I have the same number of atoms of each element on either side of the arrow. Let's go ahead and figure that out. Remember that you would never ever start off with an element that exists in more than one place on one side. And so for instance here, if you didn't know about the polyatomic ion rule, you would never start with O because it's in every single one of these reactants and products. And you can balance according to the polyatomic ion. So when I do that, if they don't have parentheses around it, I look at this polyatomic ion and I make sure I have the same thing on the opposite side. If it's exactly the same thing, so it's the exact same polyatomic ion, I can balance according to the polyatomic ion. I do the same thing for NO3s, right? Because NO3s are exactly the same on both sides of the arrow as well. So let's do this. I'm going to make sure that I have the same number on either side. What I'm going to do in order to make that happen is I'm going to take the big number in front, the coefficient, and I'm going to multiply it by the subscript. Okay, and that tells me how many of that particular element are is on that side. Okay, so I have 1 times 2 NAs. I have 1 times 1 NAs on this side because if you don't write anything down, if there's not a number there, we bother to write down letters. There has to be at least one. So two NAs on this side, one NA on that side. I need to put a two in front of this. Okay, you cannot change the subscripts, as you all well know, right? Because uh, for those of you who are like, well, why not? It's because it, you just worked really hard to make those subscripts happen by crossing the ions. That's this is how sodium nitrate comes. You can't play around with the subscripts. OK, so at this point, I'm going to take the big number in front. I did NAs. NAs are done. I'm going to take the big number in front, or the co stoichiometric coefficient, as we like to call it. Multiply it times the outside of the parentheses for the polyatomic ion. I have one chromate on this side. I have three chromates on this side. The only place I can change that is right here. But lo and behold, I just screwed up my number of lovely sodiums. So I need to change that. Woo. All that work just to erase it. There you go. And I'm throwing around my lovely markers as well. All right, so here, 3 times 2 NAs is the same uh, as what number? That's what you're asking. What number times 1 would give me the same number as 3 times 2? 3 times 2 is 6. 6 times 1 is 6. OK, I have now done that entire moment. I'm going to go to the next one. AL, I have one AL on this side. I have two ALs on this side. I need a two right here. And this should be balanced at this point. Two times three NO3s is the same as six times one NO3s. OK, the way to figure out, so we've done, by the way, before I move on, I've done those two. Yay! All right. Now we're going to do the uh, net ionic equation. And really kind of the longest but best way to do this is through the complete ionic equation. Why is, the, why is the complete ionic equation better than some other way? The reason why is because if you don't have a certain pattern, the complete ionic equation always works. OK, so if you have S's or L's or G's on multiple sides, then the complete ionic equation always works. 
that's how it is. Otherwise, you could just kind of do this more um, quick way. Um, the quicker way is going to be something that I show you after I show you the complete ionic equation. And um, it will only work if you have this specific pattern of AQ, AQ, AQS, or L, or G. Okay? So in terms of complete ionic equations, what do complete ionic equations do? They take into consideration what AQ means. AQ, when I say that I, an ionic compound is dissolved in water, then what I mean is it literally dissolves in water, kind of goes away. If it goes away, then what it is doing is it's um, disassociating into its ions. Okay? It's just breaking apart into its ions. And when it does that, I want to show that in the midst of this particular equation. So what does that mean? AQ means that each ionic compound with an AQ by it really exists in water as ions. So everything with an AQ by it, you're going to break apart into ions. Everything with an S, an L, or a G by it is together. So you're going to keep that together. All right, let's do it. This one has an AQ by it, so I'm going to write down the ions for that. Luckily, you had the ions before, so we could just rewrite those down, right? So Na plus are the ions. I have an ion of sodium, and I have an ion of chromate here. How many sodiums? You have to write down how many of each you have. So how many sodiums do I have? I have 3 times 2, which is 6. How many chromates? I have 3 times 1, which is 3. Okay. This one has an AQ by it, so I've got to break those apart into ions. I have aluminum and nitrate here. How many aluminums do I have? I have two. And how many nitrates do I have? I have six. Okay. All right, let's keep going. This one has an AQ by it, right? There's the AQ, so I've got to break that apart into ions. I get an Na plus one and an NO3 minus one here. And how many of each of those do I have? I have six NAs, and six times the outside of the parentheses is six. And then this one has an S, an L, or a G by it, which means literally in water it holds together. Okay. When you have um, sol a solid that holds together in water, we call that a precipitate. Ooh, sorry. A precipitate. There you go. That should be a C. <laughs> a precipitate. A solid hanging out in water. What it looks like is it looks like people who like, uh, if you're a person who likes a little tea with your sugar, um, iced tea with your sugar, then <laughs> it's kind of like that. You pour in a whole bunch of sugar, you're going to have sugar at the bottom of the glass. It's not quite the same because this would be kind of the equivalent of pouring two clear liquids together and then suddenly sugar shows up at the bottom of the glass and you're like, whoa, look at that. All right, so that's kind of the sense. But it's the same kind of idea. Okay, so the precipitate that would be formed here, it, I think, is a white crystalline solid. And that precipitate gives rise to the reason why this reaction overall is called a precipitation reaction. Okay, so this is the solid. I hold it together. After I've written all of this out, I've taken all of those AQs and broken them apart into their ions. Everything that was an S, an L, or a G, I hold together because that's how it literally exists in water. I look at both sides of that arrow and I look for ions that look exactly the same on both sides of the arrow. And in this case, I have two, right? I have NAs look exactly the same on both sides of the arrow, and NO3s look exactly the same on both sides of the arrow. And notice that I'm crossing them out. <laughs> the reason why I'm crossing them out is that I am actually treating this arrow as if it were an equal sign. And if you had an equal sign right here, if you had the same thing on both sides of the equals, you would cross it out because it's going to cancel out. Same thing here. Okay, so my six Na pluses and my six NO3 minuses, 
okay? And by the way, you never, ever, ever have to write down the six because we don't actually care anymore how many of them there are, okay? But I'm writing it down to begin with so that you kind of get a sense. Okay, the Na plus one and the NO3 minus one have become spectators here. Spectator ions. For all of you who are like, what the heck is a spectator ion? You have a fair point, well made, right? So what, what are spectator ions? Basically, if you have a beaker that you've poured these two solutions in, right? So you poured aluminum nitrate right here, and you poured sodium chromate right here, and you poured those into the same beaker. Then you get some amount of stuff. You get, of course, the solids, the solid at the bottom. And you're asking yourself, well, what is that solid? Well, let me tell you. All right, so here you go. When you pour these two together, you have Na plus ones, CrO4 minus twos. And notice that I'm doing plus one and minus two here. You could do it two minus. It doesn't actually matter that much. There's a convention for oxidation numbers, oxidation states versus charges. We're not going to care. It's only important if you care about it, and I don't care. All right, so you get Na pluses and CrO4 minus, minus twos here uh, from the sodium chromate. From the aluminum nitrate, you get aluminums and nitrates. What happens here is that these two see each other and like love at first sight. They really are like, we must be together. And so when they're together, they fall to the bottom of the glass. But that leaves sodium and nitrate, and this, by the way, falls to the bottom of the glass as a solid, right? In terms of the sodium nitrate, the sodium and the nitrates are just hanging out. They're just hanging out in the beaker, in water. They're not involved in what you see in the lab. So that's why they're called spectator ions. They're called spectator ions because they don't have a part of the reaction I see. They're just hanging out in solution, looking at everything that's going on. Kind of like spectators at a football game. They're not involved in the game. They're hanging out looking at it. All right, so this is a big point, and it's an important point to make, right? Na3, or Na, uh, plus one and NO3 minus one are spectator ions. The rest of what's left after I've crossed out the spectators is what I know as the net ionic equation. All right. So this, folks, is the net ionic equation. And the net ionic equation is important. It describes what you see in lab and it describes the formation of a solid, liquid, or gas, which is what I would see in lab. Okay, having said that, there's an easier way to do this, right? So, in terms of this, this is the accepted way, this is the important way. Next time, in the next video, I'll take the same equation and do the quick way of doing the net ionic equation and the spectator ions. Okay, but we got through all of our pieces. This is everything that you could do with an exchange reaction. You can go and practice, and until I see you again, I bid you adieu.